Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers Weekly Coverage of the final weeks of the Illinois General Assembly here on public television and radio. I'm Jack Titchener, along with Amanda Vinicky of Channel 11 Chicago Tonight. Amanda, great to have you back on the program. Great to be with you, Jack, always. We're heading down to that uh, uh, May 19th adjournment date, a few days uh, earlier than lawmakers usually do in uh, the month of May, uh, as opposed to May 31st. The big issue that's still hanging fire out there, and it's not unusual for this time of year, is the Illinois budget. What are you hearing? You're right, Jack. The only thing that's unusual about it is that we're having this talk about it getting close to down to the wire in early May versus in late May. But um, what is interesting about this is that on one hand, Illinois is in a great financial position, particularly relative to recent years past. The COVID is still, of course, with us, but the pandemic portion of it has by and large passed. So there, there aren't those same pressures. There also, of course, are going to be losing in the dollars, but Illinois still is seeing revenues that are higher than once the state could have imagined. Is everything hunky-dory? No, there's still a unfunded pension liability that long-term Illinois is going to have to contend with, but in a pretty decent fiscal position. What you have happened with that, though, is that all sorts of ideas and projects sort of come out of the woodwork that lawmakers right. say, oh yeah, we've got money to work with, I want a piece of it. And so there are a whole lot of spending pressures because again, there are a lot of needs. Every legislator has their own that is a priority. And so that is what is going to make this difficult, be it whether that is a um, tax breaks for widespread Illinoisans, whether it is a tax credit for those who have children, whether it is an increase to anti-violence funding, whether it is um, some of the asks that Chicago's soon to be new mayor has made of the General Assembly. There's a lot of asking. Well, and, and he was in uh, he was in Springfield this week making the rounds. Uh, Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson was there meeting with senior members of uh, both parties. And he had a uh, joint session address to uh, the General Assembly. One of the things he's asking for, along with the Illinois Municipal League, is trying to uh, ratchet back up the share of income tax uh, money that goes to the state of Illinois and comes back to local governments in the form of basically kind of a rebate. And... Uh, it was reduced a number of years ago because of the deficit problems we were having. Uh, the Municipal League is trying to bump that back up and the new mayor is wanting to see some of that money come back into Chicago's coffers. He could use all the money he should get. That was one of his big asks. This uh, It's called the Local Government Distributive Fund. There you go. We don't need to say it a ton, but just in case you see it, now you know what we're talking about. And yes, the, the mayor is on board with the Municipal League's ask. It would help the city of Chicago immensely, of course, getting back more money as the biggest municipality in the state. That was one of his asks. His second ask of the during this address was that he wanted more money to go toward specifically Chicago Public Schools schools really is what he's concerned with. The way that he phrased it was revamping the education funding formula. Now, that's something that I don't necessarily see as happening, particularly in this short a window, uh, a redo of this funding formula that, in fact, one of uh, Pritzker's chief deputies was responsible for crafting when he was a state senator. Right. But certainly... Yeah, Andy Monar. Uh, I, I, the governor's budget does propose some additional money going to that funding formula that is particularly meant to uplift the schools that are on most uneven and most in need of state funds uh, or additional funds in order to get on par with those ones that already have the local funding to spend increased dollars per pupil. So uh, there's going to be, that's one of these other demands, more money on education. Uh, what we did not hear from Johnson, I think interestingly, was a couple of his other campaign platforms that he would need the General Assembly on. And that would be things like a financial transaction tax in Chicago and a tax on real estate transactions. Again, you got such a short window as we were talking about earlier that those might be very difficult sells in this period of time. But uh, we don't know exactly what he said in some of these private meetings, particularly with the senior leadership and whether that's something that he's beginning to lobby for. He's got, uh, Chicago has a lot of needs as well. Thanks so much. And I, I, in talking to members of both parties who were in some of those meetings, the meetings did go well. Now, whether or not he'll come back with everything he asked for, well, probably not. But it's always it, there's always lots of bargaining, lots of horse trading here in the state of Illinois. Amanda Vinicky, thank you so much for your time thank on you, Illinois Jack. Lawmakers. 
Joining me now on Illinois Lawmakers, Democratic House Majority Leader Robin Gable of Evanston. Great to have you back on the program, especially in this new role. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that is, of course, uh, the second uh, most powerful position in the Illinois House of Representatives. You take over after Greg Harris's uh, retirement uh, earlier in the year. Uh, for our viewers and listeners, uh, I'd like to know a, a little bit more about what are your hopes for the position and what, are, what, what is your agenda as House Majority Leader? So this is really a great honor for me to be the majority leader. I really view it as a opportunity to help my caucus um, and continue to promote our, our democratic values. But uh, even more specifically, it's really a great opportunity to help my colleagues with their priorities. So um, I'm now like number 10 in seniority. So I really view it as my responsibility to work with my colleagues. We have a lot of new ones new members, and um, it's really uh, an honor for me to just help them uh, figure out um, how how to uh, work in this process. It's a, it's, for many people, it's a unique opportunity. They haven't really experienced anything like this before, so uh, it's great. I, I, I really get to help my colleagues, and, and for my own community, I get to amplify um, our values as well. You're known for your work as an advocate for women, children, and families, and some of the things I've read about, you're, you're working on advocating for racial equity, ethics reform, uh, expanding affordability and access to health care. That's a lot of territory to cover. You know, I think my, my uh, focus has been both on health care issues, I, I, it's my background, it's what I did for 22 years before I became a legislator. Um, you know, particularly in women's health. And I think that, you know, we still have more to do in that in that arena. Um, but also I've, I've really become a big advocate for um, uh, the environment and energy and, uh, you know, creating a world we can all live in. So uh, it's really been wonderful to be able to work on, on those two issues. As we go to record this uh, on a Thursday, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court is, is, is expected to rule on the status of the abortion pill after the Texas ban. How will the Illinois General Assembly respond depending on the outcome of the case? Well, the General Assembly, we've made it very clear that we are a, a, a pro-choice state, that we really care about reproductive freedom for everyone, and that uh, we will continue to make sure that that's, that that's that's the way we operate here in Illinois. We do have a working group that uh, Representative Cassidy is the chair of, and we will continue to look at very specific issues that, that occur and have a response um, and, and have a response from Illinois. One of the uh, issues that's uh, been working its way through is a, uh, a measure to try to provide uh, a new $700 per child uh, tax credit uh, in the state of Illinois. Where, does, where do things stand with that now? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the process of working through our budget. I think we will certainly take that into consideration as we, as we move forward. Um, you know, $700 is what uh, the first number that's been thrown out. Um, but uh, we do know that, you know, any child tax credit uh, really does go to help the children, help bring children out of poverty. Uh, help increase even middle-class children's lives. So, you know, it's something that we will consider. We've got about a minute left, uh, Leader. Uh, of course, the budget proposal is out there. The governor proposed a $49.6 billion budget for the state. Um, how is that working its way through the, le the legislative process uh, on the appropriation side? Sure. Well, the budget, the governor's budget is the beginning where we, where we start from. And, um, you know, we have our appropriation committees that have been meeting. Um, we work by in a partisan manner to uh, really review the budget. And um, our groups are, are going through the budget with a fine tooth comb and looking to see what, what, uh, what we can do this year. We really want to have a budget that is um, fiscally responsible as well as being compassionate. Leader, thank you so much for your time. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, we will certainly have you back on the program to talk more about uh, your, your job as House Majority Leader. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Another veteran of the Illinois House of Representatives joins us now on Illinois Lawmakers, Deputy House Republican Leader Noreen Hammond of Macomb. Uh, good to have you on the program again. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Uh, we're, we're, we're zeroing in on the uh, May 19th uh, adjournment date here and as one of the leading budgeteers for uh, uh, the Republicans there at the Capitol, I'm curious about where things stand right now with trying to get that uh, budget passed by uh, adjournment date. Sure, and I think it's um, everyone's goal certainly to adjourn um, uh, on May 19th. Uh, that being said, um, I, we, I believe we all would like to adjourn on May 19th um, with a budget uh, that is balanced and a budget that addresses the needs um, all of, of all of the citizens of the state of Illinois. Um, right now, as the uh, chief budgeteer for um, the House Republicans, um, when the session started, I had a conversation um, with the uh, chief budgeteer, um, my colleague on, on the Democrat side of the aisle, and um, we talked about the fact that we hoped that um, the process would be uh, bipartisan and uh, transparent. And um, since that conversation, while I have been uh, to many of the, the budget working groups and um, have heard from a number of uh, providers and, and um, hospitals and healthcare um, professionals uh, about their ask uh, to be included in the budget, um, Leader Gordon Booth and I have not had any subsequent conversations regarding the budget. Well, those are some some considerable pressures on the budget because of what health care providers uh, want to see at the table. There's a kind of a new wrinkle in it, too, with the Department of uh, Health Care and Family Services as, a, as uh, uh, relates to the uh, immigrant uh, adult program. I think that's another... $768 million that uh, uh, had not been accounted for? Um, actually, yes, but um, all total, um, it comes out to about uh, $990 million. So basically, it's a, a cost of about a billion dollars um, that certainly was uh, not um, in, in the original budget thoughts and has only come to light um, in recent weeks when the report was um, released by um, HFS at the end of March. So the governor's proposal was for around $49.6 billion for all the programs he was wanting to fund. And then the revenues were somewhere over $50 billion that we were anticipating. So how does this all stack up now with what the news we're hearing out of the Commission on Government Accountability and Forecasting, COGFA? Well, I think um, we are uh, certainly facing some very serious uh, pressures um, as it stands today. Is there any way uh, that we could possibly implement uh, the governor's introduced budget um, and as well as this um, program, this expansion of the program for undocumented um, health care uh, benefits, there is absolutely no way. Um, you cannot do both. Uh, something's going to have to give. Um, we introduced a resolution today that essentially um, would put this program um, uh, for the population between ages 41 and 54 that was passed last year. Um, it would put it on pause. We would wait for an audit uh, to come back from the Auditor General's office, um, get us some definite uh, costs and enrollment numbers, and um, put the program on pause until we had that. So um, there's considerable pressures. The um, Hospital Association um, and many of our safety nets spoke in our Medicaid work group this morning. Um, they are looking for a 20% across the board increase. Um, other providers have come before our group as well, and um, there are a lot of pressures um, and not enough revenue to fund them all. We're, we're just about out of time, but I, I guess the uh, 
I guess the watchwords are stay tuned. There's still more to come uh, in this in wrapping up this session and this budget. There is, and um, we can uh, come up with a budget that is um, representative of all of Illinois citizens and um, addresses as many of those needs as we possibly can. Leader Noreen Hammond, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. It's always appreciated. Thank you. Our next guest on Illinois Lawmakers is Senate Majority Appropriations Leader L.G. Sims, a Chicago Democrat. Great to have you back on the show, sir. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jack. Thanks for having me. As the as the lead budgeteer uh, for the Senate Democrats, uh, got to ask you where things stand now with the budget. Of course, the governor put out a proposal for I think it was forty nine point six billion dollars in new spending or not new spending, but in spending overall with more money for areas like education, higher education, early childhood and the like. How's that budget uh, uh, stacking up as it goes through the appropriations process? Well, as we always do every year, we are taking our, our time to evaluate the proposal laid out by the governor. Uh, I've been so proud of the members of the, all of the appropriations committee in, in the Senate and in the House for the, the detailed questions they're asking, the, the seriousness in which they're evaluating the governor's proposal. And I, I think we're in a very good place. We have made significant progress through the evaluation of that proposal. And I'm looking forward to having a budget that works for the people of Illinois. What were some of the proposals that the, the Black Caucus, the Legislative Black Caucus, wanted to see uh, embraced in this budget? Well, we, we've always focused on increasing our, and dealing with the issues that uh, need, need to be increasing education and focused on uh, health care, dealing with the health care deserts and economic deserts. And you see a number of those proposals laid out in the governor's budget. And there you will see particularly members of the LA Legislative Black Caucus talking about uh, making more of those investments, how we address the root causes of violence, how we address dealing with trauma issues, how we address uh, health care deserts. You know, my, in my legislative district, uh, there, there was Walmart was one, one of the four Walmarts that was closed in the city of Chicago is, ho was, is housed in the legislative district that I represent. So dealing with those economic opportunities is it's significantly important for not just only the members of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, but all members of the the ability of the Senate, and particular members of the Senate Democratic Caucus. There's a House Democratic proposal for a new $700 per child tax credit. Um, wondering how is that uh, faring? Does that is, does that have any legs? We're we're evaluating all those proposals uh, right now, and again, as I've mentioned, we're we're trying to fix as we look through and evaluate the budget overall what the revenues for the year will look like, what uh, the spending requests and recommendations will look like. And that's where we're getting into the part, the part of the session where those, those discussions and negotiations are going to begin in earnest. There was uh, some talk earlier in the uh, session that uh, because revenues have, con have continued for the time being to exceed projections, that there was some talk about uh, tax relief uh, for Illinois citizens. The Senate Republicans had a news conference earlier this week where they were talking about uh, proposals such as doing away with the franchise tax, which is particularly onerous for um, small business in the state, and extending some tax credits for uh, companies that have made an investment in Illinois and that uh, continue to uh, persist here. Well, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to having my, my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle come forward with those proposals. Uh, but what we have been doing is starting to have those conversations with them. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it, to all those discussions, and all those negotiations, because right now it's important for us, for all voices to be heard. And we're we're open to that. And we're willing to have them bring those proposals to the table. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about what they're proposing and what those details are. But what's really going to be what's going to be critical is making sure that we pass a balanced budget that's good for the people of Illinois that invests in people and make sure that we have the opportunity to to continue the good sound fiscal footing that we've put Illinois on. Uh, we've invested in our pensions. We've been invested in our rainy day fund. I want to and, and you're seeing that because of the good stewardship we have been made with the good stewardship we have, you're seeing the credit rating upgrades that continue to happen. I want to continue to see that happen uh, because that's really what, what the people of Illinois expect and deserve from us. They expect good, sound fiscal management, and we've been giving them that, and we want to continue to do that. 
We've got about 30 seconds left. Republicans continue to stress the fact that they don't want to see an awful lot of new spending because uh, of continued concerns over a national recession. Will these numbers hold as far as you're concerned? I, I'm, I, 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 we are we're concerned as well, but I would say uh, also we, we can't just arbitrarily uh, dismiss uh, the investments that we're making in people as just more spending. Uh, we are we, we have to eradicate the food deserts, the economic deserts, and the educational deserts that so many people find themselves in. And that's what we're working towards. And I, as we pass this budget, we work to pass a budget that does just that. We're making investments in people. And I think that's really what people of Illinois expect and deserve from us. Senator Sims, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. Always appreciated, sir. Always a pleasure, my friend. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to being able to do this in person again. Up next on Illinois Lawmakers, Deputy Senate Republican Leader Sue Resin of Morris. Senator Resin served in the Illinois Senate since 2010, and she's currently the Republican spokesperson on early childhood education. We're going to talk about a number of good things today. Good to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. One of the things we're looking at, of course, as the uh, clock ticks down to adjournment in uh, May is uh, progress on making a new budget for the state. The governor has a plan out there for about $50, million, $50 billion in spending. How are Senate Republicans uh, viewing the uh, progress that's been made thus far? Well, I would say that this year, because we have additional revenue coming into uh, to the Capitol, that there is an opportunity to work together on the budget. We are concerned about our priorities as well. We want to make sure that the additional revenue that we have also is put into our rainy day fund. You know, we're not always going to have a budget surplus. In fact, we're, what we're reading across the country is prepare for a downturn in the economy in the next year to two. So we want to make sure that we have a healthy rainy day fund in place that will protect us should the economy um, turn uh, turn bad. The other thing is they're regarding our priorities. It's important, especially coming out of the pandemic, to recognize that there are challenges coming out of the pandemic, challenges in our schools to catch our children up as uh, they have been learning via Zoom for two years. Uh, or um, So we want to make sure that the schools have the money to implement the tools and the programs that they need to, to make sure that our students are able to catch up and close that learning gap. So, I mean, our priorities, I think, can align with the governor in certain areas, but we also have concerns regarding the growth just of government in general. Anytime in Illinois, when there's excess money, instead of maybe saving and spending at, at a rate that we can afford, we tend to start new programs, which then in a couple years um, we have to, you know, we have to find money to fund again. So I think we need to make sure that we work together so we don't grow government, but still fund the priorities where we can find common ground with the governor and with the Democrats. And you've made some progress this session in uh, championing a new bill that would lift the somewhat, I think it's about a 30 year moratorium on new nuclear power plant construction in the state of Illinois. Give us some insights into that. It's already passed the Senate on a bipartisan uh, vote. It has passed the Senate and it just passed the House committee. So it's going to the House. And this is a bill that would lift the moratorium on um, banning nuclear in the state. This bill was passed approximately 30 years ago. And, um, but, you know, fast forward 30 years, we have new technology that is being developed at our national labs. It's called advanced modular nuclear reactors. I call them mini mods, mini nuclear reactors that are being developed. In fact, the Biden administration believes in this technology so much that they um, included approximately $5 billion in their infrastructure act that was passed two years ago for the development of this new technology. And here's why it's important. As coal plants are going offline, as we're trying to decarbonize our energy portfolio, many plants are going offline. These many modulars are able then to be, will be able to be assembled right on the plant site and tie into the grid that's already there 
and also employ the people that may have been working at these previous plans, they're good paying jobs, and create a tax base. So it's a win-win for everyone. But more importantly, why nuclear or these many modulars are important, they provide consistent, reliable power. And that's what you're going to hear a lot about in the next year. We are concerned about the reliability in our grid system for Northern Illinois and for Southern Illinois. There have been two studies, one by the PGM and by MISO that have said because of these premature closures of these coal plants and other plants around the state, that we will not have enough power to power the grid in the in the hottest of hot days or the coldest of cold weather and the extreme weather. So there are red flags everywhere from independent groups talking about the need for more reliable power. And the mini modulars provide a reliable, consistent power because they can run all of the time around the clock. Well, Senator, thank you so much for the update on that. We'll be keeping tabs on that as the session winds down and hope to have you back on the program. Thank you so much, Senator Reson. Thank you.